Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, interviews with people who have special insights into education from preschool all the way through adult ed. I'm Jim Sean. I'm your host. We're live streaming every Wednesday at noon, uh, and these uh, interviews are also posted on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center. Today we're going to be looking at what the journey is from working as a professor at the University College of Ed to the Board of Education. Our guest is Dr. Patricia Holligau. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. And since this is about education, tell us about your education. Well, I'd have to say I've been in education all my life uh -huh. as a student and as a teacher. And uh -huh. so um, I was um, in public education all my life and then um, became a public school teacher as oh, well in uh -huh. Oakland, California. And then after that, I wanted to learn more about the field of education. So I went on and got my master's and my PhD in education. So mm -hmm. particularly multicultural education at the University of Washington and social studies education. Oh, okay. Social yeah. studies. Oh, I'm interested in that. Too. <laughs> so now you're a professor at the College of Education. What mm -hmm. do you do there? So I prepare teachers, um, teach both pre-service and in-service teachers in the fields of multicultural education and social studies. And social studies as well. As well. And do you find that um, your, your teacher students mm -hmm. uh, are, are well grounded in history and social studies when they first come? Or, or is it kind of building up the skills of teaching and the content at the same time? Or, you know, what's your observation of who's coming in? Yeah. Well, I feel like a lot of teachers have their own personal experiences with social studies, and they uh, may be positive or negative, but my job is to show them the exciting world of social studies, okay. and actually how social studies is very central. I hmm. think it's a subject area that connects all of our education together, because it's about society, it's about our world, it's about the people, and, hmm. and it actually, I think, brings a lot of meaning to, to education. And so, to me, it's about um, having teachers think more critically about social studies in their practice and in their teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, included in that, I assume, would be citizenship education or that, that goal of public education. Is, is that also part of what you folks do and talk about in your classes? Yeah, in both my multicultural ed classes and my social studies classes, civic education is super important because to me, again, um, it's about learning about each other, but then also about making the world a better place. And mm -hmm. so through civics education, you understand your role in society, you understand um, what you can do to change the world to make mm -hmm. it a better place. Uh -huh. And so since you're doing social studies, I'm assuming you're talking about middle and high school teachers as opposed to elementary or I'm talking about both. You're I think both, really. yeah, oh, I think okay. it's really important that you start these kinds of um, skills and values uh -huh. at a very young age. I think kids are naturally altruistic. Kids mm -hmm. naturally want to um, get along and, and um, make the world better. And so you start with that. And then with that foundation, you can then build it with middle school and high school. So are, are the students in your classes a mix of elementary and, and upper level aspirants and yes i get the wide range you right now range. i'm teaching an introduction to multicultural education for pre-service elementary teachers uh, uh -huh. um, and then in the my graduate courses i have a range of teachers from k through 12. oh okay, okay. yeah so um so now let's <clears throat> let's back up you've been how long have you been at the college of ed 14 years 14 now. years yes, now okay 14 years it's crazy to think how long I've been there. So some, many of your students have gone on to be teachers in the, uh, in, in the public schools and perhaps private schools as well, yes? Teachers in public and private as well as professors. Uh -huh. So I have oh, yeah. um, my graduate students that are professors around, around at UH and also around the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and do you find that there's a, um, an ongoing dialogue, communication, community with those who've gone through the College of Ed after they've gone out to work in the DOE or whatnot. Is that, is that something that is sustained, sustainable? Is it 
do you feel it? You know? Well, there's a couple initiatives that our dean is promoting. Um, one in which we have people from the College of Ed follow our graduates into the field uh -huh. and through a mentorship program that supports what the Department of Ed is already doing. Uh -huh. So this, I think, keeps us connected with our graduates in, as one example. Mm -hmm. um, I would love, I, I still connect with my, my graduates, students um, that I have, mm -hmm. um, and follow with them in terms of their work. Um, of course, I think you could always want more in terms of that, but I think that, you know, we're taking steps towards that. And mentorship, I, I understand, through research shows that this really is an important support for teachers and for them continuing in the profession. Exactly. And I think it's also important to look at the mentorship also where we benefit at the College of Ed as well because mm -hmm. after when we, we see what's going on in their classroom we also see what we need to do on our end to better prepare them mm -hmm. um, to better connect what they're learning in their pre-service and service years to the actual practice in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, social studies is not one of those high stake tests mm -hmm. under No Child Left Behind. Do you think that's a good thing, maybe, <laughs> that it's not part of that? Or what are your thoughts about testing versus non-testing as, as it relates to elevating the importance of? Yeah, well, it's a double-edged sword, because when you're not tested, then there's this kind of implicit assumption it's not as important. Right. And so because of that, social studies has been sidelined in many sense as um, more focus is on language arts and math. Mm -hmm. However, um, by not testing in many ways, there is a little bit more freedom, I think, for social mm -hmm. studies teachers. Although we do have standards that, that dictate yes. and, and guide the mm -hmm. way that social studies is taught. Um, I think if there is to be any form of assessment, I would hope that it's a very authentic assessment mm -hmm. to assess social studies in terms of more project-based kinds of ways, portfolio ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm not necessarily in favor of a standardized test in social studies. Um, but I do feel like there needs to be some kind of evaluation, in a sense, um, so that we do show that there is importance on this, on this subject area. Uh -huh. So uh, you've been teaching 14 years. Social studies is, is, is your sort of kuleana, along with multicultural. Uh, and then you get this phone call or something of, would you like to be on the board that determines everything in public <laughs> education here? Yeah. If you had told me that I'd be on the Board of Education, I would have said, I wouldn't have ever dreamt that. Uh -huh. um, in fact, I have a, a story to tell because the first time that I did meet the Board of Education was when I testified before the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, three years ago, social studies, um, the credits of social studies was being proposed to decrease from four credits to three for our secondary level. Uh -huh. And it really woke up the social studies community to respond to this because mm -hmm. we didn't want that to happen. And mm -hmm. so I became involved with a group called Aloha Posse to um, basically protect the four credits. And so mm -hmm. I presented before the board, testified. Um, I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and in, ultimately, in the end, because I think of our advocacy, um, the board did decide to retain the four credits. And mm -hmm. so I share that story because I was on the other side um, of those before the board. And I think it is a testimony to the board that now I am on the Board of Education and that Mm -hmm. My perspective as an educator is valued and one that is um, sought for. So your experience as a testifier before the board, mm -hmm. right, you know, and now you're on the other side of the yes. table. You want to talk a little bit about the difference uh, in perception? I mean, uh, did you feel that when you were testifying there was enough time and there was enough, <laughs> uh, you know, oh, here we go, another testifier, or, right. or what was that experience like? Because many, I think, professors and, and others are very nervous about testifying, whether it be the ledge, mm -hmm. legislature, or the Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, first of all, I have to say it is very important yeah. to testify and let your voices and perspectives be heard before these bodies. Um, because unless they hear otherwise, um, we're going to think... Um, the way we're going to think unless we're right. thought differently hearing a different perspective. And so 
In terms of my experience before the board, um, I felt like actually the two minutes was sufficient <laughs> because I had a prepared statement and I felt like you know I had everything that I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I did have questioning afterwards, and so I precisely remember you know the chair at the time. Chair Horner asking me questions about my testimony, mm -hmm, um, and so mm -hmm. I appreciated that. And um, again, he said, as a professor of education, you know, we value your input, and so I did feel validated. Okay. Um, so I feel like for those that do testify, and now being on the other end, I really value hearing um, what they have to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even now, backing up, you've got this phone call mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yes. Uh, would you like to be on the board? I'm going yes. to nominate you. Right? right. But you have to be confirmed by the state senate. Right. So give us a little insight into what state senators were interested in, mm -hmm. asked about. Mm -hmm. Most people never go through that process. Yeah, right? yeah. It was actually really exciting. I looked at it as an opportunity to meet um, our political leaders, mm -hmm. um, not only for them to learn what I'm interested in and my background, but also to mm -hmm. hear what they had to say about uh -huh. education. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, in talking to the legislators, first they wanted to know, obviously, what were my goals, what would be mm -hmm. my goals on the Board of Education, and then they shared theirs. And so a couple um, comments that I got were um, like the importance of the communication I think between um, the Board of Ed members and state legislators um, and that we need to do a better job of communicating mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because uh, though two different bodies you know we support each other in different ways for education mm -hmm. the ledge being financial as well as um, policy and, and then the board of course and policy. Um, there were some Questions particularly around um, Common Core um, mm -hmm. at the time. This was a couple of years ago when I went before the um, before the, the legislators, and they had questions on my thoughts of Common Core. And so mm -hmm. I appreciated that they knew about <laughs> this curriculum, this federal mandate, if you will, uh -huh. um, in the schools. And so it was really actually nice to have a dialogue with them about it um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and about. Um, the importance of standards, yet the importance of flexibility of the implementing of standards. Mm -hmm. And so what I shared with them was um, I felt like if you really looked at Common Core and the messages that it's trying to um, promote in terms of critical thinking and real world problem solving, mm -hmm. then that's what I really focus on because to mm -hmm. me in multicultural education and in social studies, those are very key core principles mm -hmm. um, of mm -hmm. these subject areas. and. That was a way to get that through um, with the support of a, a mandate like Common Core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, did they did they have serious concerns about the direction the board had been going in, or you know, express things like that, or was it mainly, oh, what are you thinking, you know, on, uh, on Common Core and other things? I'm just kind of wondering yeah. what, you know, uh, did they see this the board of ed as a partner or a strange group that uh, they don't know or you know not the the sense that I got was not that we're a strange group yeah. I felt like um, there were relationships between some of the, the members that were existing on the board uh -huh. um, and so I felt like I was actually coming in at a good time the appointed board had already been in existence for three mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. so I felt like the appointed board that core group really did a lot of work in terms of um, uh, establishing a system for yes. the Board of Education, mm -hmm. one in which there was a structure. Uh -huh. um, and I think having a structure with um, particular committees, such as the Student Achievement Committee, Human Resource, Finance Infrastructure, and Audit, um, and consistent committees that were focused on issues in an organized way, I think helps outsiders in many ways to be able to then figure out what the system is and how they can enter their perspectives um, into the conversation. Well, we're talking with uh, Dr. Patricia Hagalow, uh, who is a member of the Board of Education. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to talk about that experience and some initiatives that she's been involved with. We'll be back in one minute. Great. Aloha. This is Reg Baker, and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, 
and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on Think Tech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Aloha! How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Aloha, welcome back to Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. We're talking about what it's like to go from the College of Ed into the Board of Education, right? Yes. So you've now been confirmed by the State Senate, yes. right? And what surprised you? You know, when you're, you're, you're now on a, a major policy for constitutionally created. Right? right, right, right. Yeah, so anything that you expected but didn't happen or vice versa as a new member? Well, I, I still have to pinch myself in many ways because, um, again, I started off as, as an outsider in a sense, and now I'm mm -hmm. an insider. And so I'm excited about the role that I play. Um, in terms of surprises, I don't think there's as many surprises um, as I would think other than, um, I mean, I feel like I still depend on um, the importance of relationships um, mm -hmm. that I think in any case as a teacher, you know, relationships are important to have with your students and with your colleagues. And so the same is the case with the Board of Ed. You know, I think it's important to have um, relationships with your colleagues um, and uh, you are with them for, for so many years. And I think in many ways relationships is what um, helps the understanding of, of all of our different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So. In terms of other surprises, um, I feel like it's, well, I knew I was going to be getting into it and there'd be a lot of time that I would have to devote to this, but I didn't realize how much time it really does um, take out of you. And I just feel like I do have a short window of time to make a difference. And so I really am pouring a lot of time and effort and focus mm -hmm. into this. And um, But again, it's very connected to all the work that I do. And so I see it. Um, enhancing the work that I do at the College of Ed, as well as my work at the College of Ed, enhancing um, my work on the board. Okay, so the board meets formally mm -hmm. as a group once a month. Twice a month. Twice a month. Twice a month. Okay, twice a month. And then there are committees. Yes. And they meet once a month, twice a month. So the board, the committees meet in the morning, um, uh -huh. and so we alternate between um, the, well, we meet every first and third Tuesday of the month. Okay. And um, on the first Tuesdays are usually our student achievement committee um, and our audit committee meetings, and then mm. we have our general board meeting in the afternoon. Okay. The second, excuse me, the third Tuesday of the month, we have our human resource committee and our finance and infrastructure committee meet mm -hmm. in the morning, and then our general board meetings are in the afternoon. So you're obviously part of the general board meetings. Yes. How many committees are you on? So I am officially on two committees. So okay. I chair the Student Achievement Committee now, mm -hmm. and I'm on the Human Resource Committee. Okay. Um, I, though I'm not officially on the, the FIC and the Audit Committee, I attend those meetings. The FIC? The Finance and oh, Infrastructure oh, oh, Committee. Okay. Yeah. So I attend those meetings because it's really important to understand the the finances of education, um, right. because uh, where the money goes often shows where our values and our priorities are. And so as chair of the Student Achievement Committee, I think it's really important that, mm -hmm. um, that I can influence some of those decisions as well. So what's going on between these formal committee meetings? A lot of reading? A lot of reading in terms of um, researching some of the issues that are going before the board, as mm -hmm. well as meetings with um, school officials and community members. Mm -hmm. um, 
board members also have particular interests and particular policies and so we have mm -hmm. meetings around those kinds of issues and um, I try to make it out to as many schools as possible attending mm -hmm. uh, one of the perks of being a board member is I get to attend events like graduation and May Day and mm -hmm. openings of schools and so forth and so it's it's um, I love that part of it mm -hmm. um, and then I also um, roll up my sleeves and, and do the work in terms of policy. Mm -hmm. So before you became a board member, mm -hmm. you must have had a view of what the department was, some sense of, oh, I see some things I like, I see some, you know. How has that changed, mm -hmm. right? Be I have, before and after. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I have more, I have to say I have more of an appreciation Mm -hmm. of the Board of Ed and the Department of Education and what we what we do I think for the schools. Um, I think when you are in the middle of it and seeing all the things that happen um, you have a greater appreciation. I think you know I also have a greater appreciation of where we have come from to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that um, that, 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 that there's been many different um, mandates and um, issues that have um, fallen onto the Department of Education um, within the last couple years, which has been a lot of, um, I think, stress for everybody around. But I feel like um, the newness of mm -hmm. some of these initiatives um, and the, the understanding of what those entail have, um, have moved forward. And so people, I think, are now um, not at the stage of of um, what's the word feeling like overwhelmed hopefully mm -hmm. um, and that there is more of like okay I now know what I need to do um, I have hopefully some flexibility to achieve this um, and then they can move forward I know one of your interests is English language learners right talk a little bit about what the, what the schools are supposed to do mm -hmm. and what you've been doing on your own to raise this to another level? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I just want to point out with the term English language learners, I like to refer to our students as multilingual learners. Okay. Um, and by doing that, you reframe the conversation already to look at our students as having a language that they bring, a language and a culture that they already bring into the classroom. Mm -hmm. and so they are learning English, but I think we oftentimes don't um, step back to realize that these kids bring in a wealth and a richness of, of linguistic and cultural diversity. And so mm -hmm. I know when I um, use the word multilingual learner, it just makes me stop and think, okay, they, they, um, they we um, have another language that we bring in. So in terms of our multilingual ELL learners, um, schools are obligated to um, by the federal government, by the federal government yeah. mm -hmm. to um, to meet their needs in terms of learning English mm -hmm. um, and so to accommodate um, and provide um, particular um, accommodations um, resources um, to uh, students and families mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. of English language learners multilingual students now you you put together a huge group uh, to work on the creation of a policy mm -hmm. for which there was none right. at the board level. Right. Yeah. Right. And so at the board level, I also sit on a um, on policy audit committee. Okay. And so on this committee, we reviewed all the policies of the Board of Education. And mm -hmm. so in doing that, we helped to organize the policies according to and in line with the strategic plan by the Board of Ed and the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, and then also in doing so, I saw um, that we lacked a policy around ELL multilingual learners. And so mm -hmm. we are one of two states, I think, in the nation that does not have a policy um, for our multilingual ELL learners. And so um, that has been an area that, um, that I worked on because coming into the board, one of my missions was to work around policy that benefits um, underrepresented and marginalized populations. Mm -hmm. And so our multilingual and our ELL students are, are one of those groups that literally sometimes feel they don't have a voice um, in, in education. Mm -hmm. And previous, in previous times, uh, the 
immigrant community or the ELL community or the multilingual community mm -hmm. was a little bit different. But now we're seeing uh, particular uh, trends of many immigrants from Pacific Island mm -hmm. nations. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, they're coming to us maybe slightly different than other groups that had historical ties with Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is, is that a special challenge? It's an opportunity and uh, a challenge. And so um, first, if you do look at our multilingual ELL population, they make up 13.5% of the population. And of that 13.5%, mm. the highest languages that are spoken are Filipino languages. Uh -huh. And then the next would be um, languages in the Micronesian mm. um, area. And so it is important that we know who our students are um, so that, again, we mm. could um, recognize and value their cultural and linguistic backgrounds as well as provide the supports that they need with um, particular resources and translators mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, ways of connecting with this particular population. And, and we designate them because they've been given a test mm -hmm. uh, that shows that their English is not at, at their grade level mm -hmm. um, and um, or maybe also that they speak another language at home. Right. Is that a criteria? Yeah, I mean, so when students first come into the department, they are um, they fill out a, a, a demographic type survey, and so mm -hmm. if they list that um, their home language or language spoken at home is not English, then uh -huh. then automatically there is services and, and testing mm -hmm. to identify what their level of English is, and mm -hmm. then if that's the case, if they need um, to be particularly put into certain. Um, mm -hmm programs or supports, and, and that's the next step. So uh, how's it going in, in developing this policy? Yeah, that's uh, a great know, question. I mean, you have this federal mandate, which right. is teach them English, but a more sensitive, comprehensive uh, vision, vision uh, of, right. hey, you speak another language. Right. Great, right. right. So what's that like of balancing those two. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, they support each other. Uh -huh. I mean, research has shown that when students maintain their languages, their home languages, that helps them learn English. Uh -huh. It may seem counterintuitive that you're learning another language and that have more than one language is too much, but in effect, actually, mm -hmm. having these multiple languages um, increases your cognitive abilities, um, your frameworks to be able to learn a new language. Mm -hmm. um, and so research has shown, you know, maintaining your home language, I think, is very important. And so. But at the very least, for teachers, they don't need to know necessarily all the languages of their students, but have a mindset in which they view their students' languages as assets. Oh. So as far as where it stands now, um, there's been a couple different um, things that have, um, I think, supported our um, multilingual ELL policy. So the board, we just did pass in June um, a policy for the seal of biliteracy. The seal of biliteracy. The seal okay. of biliteracy. Okay, we're going to learn about that <laughs> after our next one minute break. We'll be right back. Okay, great. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Albers from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on. Uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Moriwaki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Mover Shakers and Reformers. We're talking with Dr. Patricia Holligal. Yes. And you were just mentioning that there's a new seal of biliteracy that yes. the board has 
adopted to honor and encourage students who speak another language. Exactly. That's yes. exactly it. In fact, we're actually part of a national movement um, in which I think Hawaii is either the 11th or the 12th state that passed the seal of biliteracy. And this, exactly what you says, is honors um, the languages that a student um, learns in the classroom and brings to the classroom. And mm -hmm. so the seal um, says that um, if you um, are proficient in English and or Hawaiian, which is our other official state language, mm -hmm. as an anchor language and an additional language, um, proficient in an additional language, then you receive a seal of biliteracy at the secondary level. So um, is there some stamp that goes on your diploma when you graduate from high school? That That's what we're hoping. Oh, okay. Um, because again, it just encourages kids to maintain their languages. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually a movement that has been supported widely by our business community because okay. they see a value of mm. students um, having another language, mm. um, especially in, in our different industries in Hawaii. Um, and so they have been a solid supporter. Um, the University of Hawaii um, has been a solid supporter through the Language Roadmap Initiative mm -hmm. um, of the Seal of Biliteracy. And in fact, they were the ones that um, promoted the Seal of Biliteracy um, at, the, at the ledge level. And then it eventually ended up in the board level um, mm -hmm. to pass this policy. Now, there's an entire institute that has been created to promote school empowerment. Mm -hmm. And the governor has talked the talk yes. so far. How is the board seeing this, this new trend, this new push, whatever you want to call it? Right, right. right. You have a lot on your plate, right. and now comes school empowerment. Right. Well, I believe in school empowerment. I feel like unless a school is empowered to, to make change, to innovate, um, it needs to happen at the school level. Um, but I also feel like there needs to be um, a system of support for mm -hmm. schools. And so it's important that um, schools have empowerment, but mm -hmm. I think it's also important that we all join together and have certain common goals mm -hmm. and we're guided by certain frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and so something that holds our system together. Um, if, if schools are just developing initiatives um, kind of randomly and here and there, um, I feel like it's important that, that, that there are certain things that, that we work together towards. Mm -hmm. So empowerment to me means within a structure, um, a system, mm -hmm. that there's flexibility to mm -hmm. be able to implement um, the, the good work that a school can do. So we already have standards mm -hmm. and standards that are now common core standards. Right. And we already have tests mm -hmm. right, on a few subjects, right? And, uh, but, um, so with school empowerment, what would a school, principal, community, whatever, be able to decide that they wouldn't have decided before school empowerment became a thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think what the governor and um, this notion of school empowerment has done has focused the, the, the resources at the school level, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Um, but I think, again, like I mentioned, it's also important that at the systems level, the central level, there's resources there to support mm -hmm. the schools um, and that there's an infrastructure of leadership, mm -hmm. I think, that supports leaders. And so, um, you know, the way that, um, that the system, I think, has been structured or that we're moving towards is mm -hmm. that we have, um, ultimately, there's a superintendent, we're one school district, but other than that, we have our CAS system, our CAS system in which um, we complex have complex areas, areas that, um, that are to meet the needs of that community. And so there's a leader that sees um, that community's needs um, and those schools' needs and helps to uh, provide leadership in that area. And so, um, you also need these leaders to look at articulation across um, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, you need to, again, offer um, the implementation of how standards are delivered in the schools. Mm -hmm. So, But everything you've said is not power at the school. It's power somewhere else. And many of your policies mm -hmm. explicitly say, you want to change this, somebody above the school has to agree. Mm. Right? 
and and the principals in the last year came out with a pretty critical mm -hmm. survey right. of what critical of you know so this is about where the decision is made right mm -hmm. what i'm hearing is that there's a kind of uh, discomfort mm -hmm. with the notion of just go for it mm -hmm. uh you want to have that balance right um uh, but you know how is the board seeing this i mean is it uh, are they are you going through the policies and saying eh, the, the cas doesn't have to decide this and that and the bill schedule or or are you mainly talking about resources hmm well i feel like well, what I'm hoping is that mm -hmm. with a structure that's set up, there's flexibility and decisions made at the school level mm -hmm. in terms of programming, certain initiatives, and how these mm -hmm. are actually implemented at the school level. And, and so, and with principals obviously taking into account who their students are and the needs of the mm -hmm. community. And so, one example in which perhaps um, the school level resources are put to the school level is that we did. Um, listen to the the cow, the committee on weights, mm -hmm. when they were reevaluating and looking at how um, the student weight of formula um, monies are um, designated. They wanted to bring more money to the school level, mm -hmm. um, and this was seen through the request to actually add additional monies for our ELL students. And so yes. there's a request for ten million dollars to add um, the student weighted formula to add more weight and money to um, ELL students. And so mm -hmm. the money there would then not go necessarily to the system, but mm. to schools that actually had the numbers of students that had our ELL population. And so there you see resources getting pushed down mm -hmm. um, to the schools as an example. Now, earlier you were talking about the value of our outsiders coming and testifying and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And because the governor has been so a vocal during the campaign about school empowerment and mm -hmm. this, the Education Institute. Has the governor sat down with you folks and talked about what what he what he would like to see that's different? Yes, he in has. fact he has. And um, it's important that we sit down with the governor because uh -huh. he is the steering the ship, if and you will. And the money. And the money. <laughs> yes, and, yeah. and we're there as an extension of him. And uh -huh. so um, I think it is important that um, that um, our actions um, and our decisions, um, you know, are also discussed with the governor. Um, I feel like um, the department and the board of ed have come a long way. I think um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, changes in the department, and I think even more so with the school empowerment kind of focus, the department is. Um, responsive to to principals and mm -hmm. hopefully um, you know with the principal roundtable that is established to hear more voices from the principals mm -hmm. we see that the Department of Ed is responding to mm -hmm. um, to their concerns another example that I want to point out um, in terms of listening to principals is in the policies that we are developing mm -hmm. it is important to me that we get their perspective mm -hmm. again um, we don't want policies that are empty policies or one that are just on the books but ones that people really believe in and that will really really help our schools mm -hmm. so um, at this point there's no sort of like committee on school empowerment per se right no. um, did the governor suggest that he would be you know, proposing rather specific decentralized ideas uh, in legislation, or is that um, I don't, wait and see? Or, well, you know? I think that, that you know, we have a structure in place in which we have a mm -hmm. board of education, mm -hmm. we have um, a department of education, and so I think what's important is just the communication between all of these different organizations. Mm -hmm. And so I think communication is so key in not assuming things, not presuming that things were the way they were and so to me if we can work with in that system and support mm -hmm. each other then it's the benefit to all to all students and so um, and working together and I think mm -hmm. that's what we all want we all want the same thing and so we're all trying to um, achieve it in different ways and I think there's room um, to achieve it in different ways so um, the school empowerment is definitely one that I believe in I you know and there's um, you know, there's other areas that I also think can support that. 
So at, at all the schools, there's a school community council. It's right. a kind of stakeholder group. Right. And it's got you know, principal and teachers and parents and whatever, right? They're the only sort of multi-stakeholder group at a school level. Right. And I was wondering if the board was beginning to look at that as an, you know, a more important group right. that might be given a certain amount of more authority and power in and of itself. Right, and that therein lies the, the crux, right? So yeah. for these um, community school councils, they help inform and support the school and they um, are the voice, hopefully, for the principal. And so, mm -hmm. you know, principals, I think, have different relationships with different school community councils. But mm -hmm. ultimately, they are there to, um, to support as well as to hold accountable, I think, the goals of the schools. And mm -hmm. so um, that's where I think the principals, uh, mm -hmm. they definitely should use these school community councils in, in um, these positive ways. So they're, they're an advisor group. And I know in the policies mm -hmm. and on the board, website, it says very explicitly, this group is not a decision maker. Hmm. It's an advisory. Right. right? And, and that's why I was asking whether or not, in, in the interest of communication that you've emphasized, mm -hmm. if the board might be looking at this as, as a diverse group of stakeholders right. that might have, you can do this now. Right. You don't have to ask. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so more power, in a sense, than what the policy proposes? Well, there's, the policy says there's no power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, you know, looking at the existing structure, where you see actual decision-making power mm -hmm. might be placed at a, at a school level, mm -hmm. not at the district or the CAS level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well... I wonder if you if you need to have a policy that says that or one in which we just believe that there is that there mm. should be power that lies in the constituents that we serve the families and mm. the students and so mm. um, you know if if I was a principal and um, I would feel like that is an important body that would uh -huh. um, shape the decisions that I make and you see already how important some of these are mm -hmm. when they um, are vocal enough sometimes to question mm -hmm. um, certain principles that are in place and so um, so I do feel like they all already are powerful even if they don't necessarily have it written in the policy that they are a decision-making mm -hmm. body so we've been talking with dr. Patricia Hagalo about her experiences perceptions how she sees the department coming from a teacher of teachers mm -hmm. to a manager of teachers in some respect or a policymaker uh, and the importance of communication and relationships everywhere. Yes. And uh, maybe that's an important lesson to leave us on. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. We'll be back again next week with another edition of Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Aloha. Aloha.